G'day viewers, sorry for the unusual intro, uh, my sound wasn't recording and uh, there was people down there and I don't like talking in front of people, it's just weird. So uh, that is where I am at the moment, I'm on uh, the Nullarbor Highway, which stretches between Western Australia and South Australia, South Australia is that way, Western Australia is that way, this is the Nullarbor Desert, which Nullarbor in Aboriginal means treeless plain. And uh, what I just showed you is, if you can see off in the distance there, the white caravans, that is the ocean where all those cliffs were and everything. But I didn't want to do the video down there because it um, became tourist central. And I hate talking in front of people and I'm already talking too much. So this video is about a follow up on yesterday's video of why can't I have the inverter capacity I want um, and that we're top by Western Power what we have to have. So I explained that yesterday, the problem of what too much solar going into the grid does. And then logically, as I expected, and I didn't want to sort of uh, go off on a tangent yesterday explaining it because I always go off on bloody tangents, um, is, well, if we're export limiting our systems over five kilowatt, then why can't we have a much bigger solar inverter anyway? Because we're not sending that power back out to the grid. So I'm gonna explain why as quickly as I can without dribbling, and then I'll possibly go into a few other technical details. Uh, well, as technical as I can get anyway. I'm, I'm just an electrician, I'm not an electrical engineer. Um, I'm just sharing my 25 years of experience in the solar industry with you. So if we have Let's say, for example, a relatively nice day in Perth, Western Australia, and uh, we have lots of homes, all with massive inverters. And for the most part, those inverters are satisfying the demand of the household. All right, now, if a event occurred such as lots of clouds, uh, or rain, then, and and we've and you know half an hour before it was a beautiful clear sky, then all of a sudden it's gone dark and cloudy, then all that demand is put onto the grid. Okay, your 10 kilowatt, 20 kilowatt inverter is no longer making 10 or 20 kilowatts, it's now making nothing. But your home has still got massive demand because it's actually a hot day. And I've just noticed my rhubarb's bent from when I hit a kangaroo the other morning. Bugger. Um, that's damage from already hitting one when I came out of Victoria before I had the rhubarb fitted. Bugger. Oh well. Um, see, I'm fucking doing it again, going off on a bloody tangent. Anyway, so let's say, for example, the, uh, the clouds roll in, all that load is put onto the grid. Well, as explained yesterday, we do have a relatively fragile grid. Essentially, the Swiss or the Southwest interconnected system is a massive standalone system. We're not connected to other states uh, where we can switch between if there is events and that sort of thing. And the response of the network is relatively slow. So if all that demand is all of a sudden put on our generators they can't respond in time so you can see where i'm going with that if they can't respond in time and all of a sudden all this massive demand's been put on the grid then again we've got grid instability we're going to have low voltage issues we're going to have frequency issues and the generators are going to disconnect okay so essentially and I think I explained that quite well. That was about my 10th attempt because I can't talk this morning. My brain's not connected to my mouth. Um, so I think I just explained that really quite well. But now I'm going to go off on a, a little bit more technical sort of stuff. Um, so in, uh, in the Western Power Network, we have multiple generators scattered all across the state. They're mostly gas turbine generators and the response time of the generators isn't particularly quick. So you'll have your baseline generators, uh, which are providing that solid um, baseline power for our grid tied inverters to tie into. And you've also got what they call spinning reserve generators, where the generators are fired up, because a gas turbine, uh, I think, takes 
probably 20, 30 minutes to get uh, fired up and get up to speed. Um, they don't just switch on in an instant. And um, so it takes a bit of time. So they'll have your baseline generators, uh, which are providing that solid baseline power. And um, j just on that, this, this sort of lends itself also to, I can't believe how many caravans there are out here. We're literally in the middle of nowhere. Uh, but this is the link between Western Australia and the eastern side of Australia. This is actually the only highway between east and west, um, and there's a, a railway off in the desert, off in the distance over there also, which is also the only railway. Um, so if this highway is flooded or damaged, say a truck catches fire, which often happens because Raj doesn't check his bearing temperatures and his truck catches fire, um, that highway is closed and then if we say we get flooding on um, the railway then that is closed also and we are essentially cut I say essentially a lot we are then uh, essentially cut off from the other side of Australia um, so everything that goes east or west either comes on this highway or the railway just over there Anyway, um, generators. So the baseline generators provide that solid power. Now, it's a rotational, heavy, solid energy. Um, our grid tight inverters are transformerless electronic devices, uh, which are quite fragile. Um, they, yes, they produce power, but they can't handle, handle surge capacity and that sort of thing. And that, where I'm going with that is it, it's kind of, you know, using a, a hybrid transformerless uh, inverter such as SIG Energy um, or day inverters uh, for off-grid. Now, off-grid, you need a good, solid, transformer-based inverter uh, because you need that transform, you need that solid energy like uh, Selectronic or Victron and yes, I know I'm digressing a fair bit now, and I said I would, um, so I'm just elaborating on some points. But I've already given you the answer, so if you want to tune out, you can tune out. Um, but uh, so we have that baseline generator, which gives us the good solid power, and then we have the spinning reserve generators, which are fired up, um, but they're just spinning, uh, ready for demand um, uh, from the grid. But it still can't happen in an instant. It still takes, you know, minutes uh, for those generators to react. And like I said, if, if all of a sudden we have an event like storm clouds or something like that, and there is massive power consumption, and for the most part, those household inverters are satisfying that consumption, then that power is and we have an event that power is then power demand is then transferred to the grid the grid can't respond in time how does the grid or the network respond with those generators well it's operated by aemo which is the australian energy market operator there's not some dude sitting in the tower looking at the sky and looking at a meter with showing how many kilowatts Perth is using. It doesn't happen like that. I, I would imagine there are computer-based algorithms and those um, would predict that there might be an event coming. But, you know, if... I don't know, then the, the guy sitting at the computer desk is out sucking on his blueberry vape, having a break or something, and an event occurs. I'm exaggerating, but there can be delays. Uh, you know what I mean? Like the network can't react in an instant. Um, and when clouds come over, the power produced by all those grid tight inverters drops off in an instant, it's straight away and the grid can't react, uh, sorry, the generators can't react in time. So that's the problem. That's why, you know, you can't have those big home inverters pumping out power, um, because it, again, it all comes back to stability of the grid and so forth. And the answer should be in the feed-in tariff. Um, you know, remember the good old days where we used to get 47 cents? Uh, for every kilowatt of energy fed back into the grid, people were making thousands of dollars out of it. The network wanted your solar power back then. Uh, they needed it. And uh, ultimately, it's all about us burning less stuff, whether it be coal or gas. Um, 
you know that's what it's all about the renewable energies is 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 burning less stuff you know we can't keep burning stuff and heating up the planet also be good if people didn't litter but anyway um, feed-in tariff used to be 47 cents now it's uh, what well, even less than three cents at peak times and you get a little bit more in in peak times and that's you know like I said back then they wanted our power now um, you know Perth for example rooftop solar exceeds peak demand there's too much solar already uh, so they're having to you know export limit it and just mitigate the effects of uh, all this rooftop solar so the answer is kind of there in the feed-in tariff you know that they, they once were giving us big money for it lots of money and and now it's bugger all because they don't need it and we're actually going to the opposite where um, I think some states have a, a solar tax or something and you know people get irate about all that you know why are they charging us for solar? they don't want to charge you for it they simply don't want it they don't need it anymore and in fact you exporting all this power in times of um, peak solar production causes them problems it's uh, it's financial problems that the network operator has to deal with and um, it's constantly evolving I just felt in a rabbit hole it's constantly evolving with uh, technology is changing we're coming up with better solutions such as uh, the emergency solar management program uh, export limiting all these things the inverters are getting smarter they can react quicker and so now we've got you know a little bit of a, a, a little bit of a um, relief where we can have 10 kilowatt inverters on single phase now so you know they're giving us a little bit more because they're managing the the network it's getting smarter it's evolving and that's always going to keep happening so with everything i've just said you're probably thinking okay now i know what the solution is and if you've worked if you figured that out you know the solution is batteries all right so if we've got all these batteries full of energy then that is potentially uh, a solution to our problem because drawing energy from a battery is instant it's not a gas turbine generator getting fired up and waiting for it to react it's instant so this comes back to our state subsidy and having to go on a VPP which is virtual power plant program within the state subsidy and that is the network coming up with further solutions to solve the problem of the renewables industry becoming so popular and having so much energy and um, evolving and giving us that stable network and uh, not having power outages and, and so forth but trying to keep everyone happy it's a fine balancing act and uh, especially for us here in in Perth um, we, we are just one big standalone system and we've got to treat it with respect and that's why all these systems are put in place uh, like I said it is for logical reasons and it is for the greater good of everyone every consumer every client on the Western Power and the horizon power networks in western australia so hopefully that makes sense guys i know i went off on a lot of tangents there um i know some of you like that some of you just want me to get straight to the point and i think i did that at the very beginning of the video there and uh but that's the answer there that is why you can't have the uh, an inverter size as big as you want even though we export limit because that demand can still be put on the grid in an instant and cause problems with the grid and um, cause shutdowns and that sort of thing which we don't want all right uh, hope you got a bit out of that one and I answered some more questions I've probably created some more questions which is great I read the comments um, thank you everyone that does comment thank you for everyone that likes and subscribes I really appreciate that it um, gives me the incentive to keep doing these videos and keep educating and helping people cheers guys I'm gonna keep driving that way now uh, I should get home tonight my total d journey distance is about 4,200 kilometers from Brisbane to my home in Perth 
and I think I've got about 1700 kilometers left to go so hopefully I'll get home at about midnight tonight and I can sleep in my own bed instead of in the frickin van which would be nice cheers guys